Welcome back. Last time we introduced neural networks and showed how you could use them to approximate any function. Now we'll apply them to model language, which involves fitting this type of function. Given some text like this, we'd like to predict the last word. We'll use some kind of neural network. We first need to turn our words into numbers so the neural network can understand them. You could just number every word alphabetically, but then synonyms like apex and zenith would have very different numbers. It's better to map semantically similar words like this to numbers, or vectors in this case, that are similar. Methods that do this are called word embeddings, and they're readily available online. Okay, now we're ready to design our big language neural network. Perhaps something like this, and you can add even more layers, neurons, and weights to increase capacity, but it's still not going to work very well. The problem is just too hard. We need to give the network a bit more help. Let's go back to our favorite example. Suppose I left out the last word. Could you guess it? I bet you could. In fact, I bet you could do it with only these four words, a kind of hair that rhymes with bed. This is a key insight. You just need to pay attention to a subset of the words. What if we could train a neural network to solve this attention problem? We'll do this with an attention network that takes the input words and outputs attention weights between zero and one. We'll multiply these weights by the words themselves and feed the results into the next word predictor network. So how do you train the attention network? Well, you could hire people to annotate rhymes and other word associations in lots and lots of text and use this as training data. But that sounds like a pain and it turns out there's a much better way. Let's train both of these networks together. Here the prediction network is telling the attention network what it needs to learn so it can predict next words better. For example, say the network predicts brown instead of red. Brown doesn't rhyme with bed, so the backpropagation algorithm might try to increase the attention on bed and decrease weights that led to the selection of brown. This works really well, and this combined network is called a transformer. And while the full architecture is pretty complex, I'll take you through the basics. The implementation of the attention network varies a bit from what I just described. It operates one word at a time. Let's start with the word still. The network estimates how much every other word relates to still and encodes these attention scores between zero and one. We'll then take a weighted sum of these words and encode it as a context vector C. The other words are processed in the same way. For example, the word changed has a different pattern of dependencies, resulting in its own context vector. In the end, the attention network generates a context vector for every word. Then, these context vectors are fed into the prediction network along with the original words. So how do we use this to generate text? Let's choose a word to start our sentence, its, and feed it through the network. It predicts A as the next word. Actually, you'll get multiple suggestions with different probabilities, and you can randomly choose one of the best. But suppose we chose A. We'll now add the word A as our next input and feed that through the network to generate the third word, lot, and so on. Okay, let's try a harder one. The 16th president was Abraham Lincoln, so the next word should be Abraham. But wait a minute, we've just been talking about word attention patterns. How is the network going to know about presidents? And if it can answer questions like this, then it needs to memorize all possible facts. That's a pretty tall order. To do that, we're going to have to give our network a lot more capacity. We can do this by stacking many of these prediction attention layers. How many? Well, GPT-3 has 96 of these. GPT-3 is a popular model from OpenAI, and the Palm model from Google has a similar number. These models have hundreds of billions of parameters. That's enough capacity to do some really impressive things. Stacking these attention models allows for higher level reasoning, whereas the lower layers focus on word relationships and syntax. The higher layers can encode more complex relationships that encode semantics. All right, we're ready to train our network. We'll need some text to train on. How much? Well, basically all of it. 
Today's large language models have read most of the internet and publicly available books. That's half a trillion words. You're probably guessing that it takes a long time to train large language models. That's true. Training GPT-3 would take 355 years on a single GPU or computer. But transformers are designed to be highly parallelizable, so you can do it in about a month with a few thousand GPUs. Let's start with Q&A. In each case, I specified the blue text as input. It got most of these facts right. It had a hard time factoring this extremely large number, and the per capita income figure was a bit off. It's pretty good at writing poems. Here's the prompt I gave, and here's GPT-3's results. I kind of love this one, even though it's technically not quite a haiku. You can ask it to translate languages. I don't know how many of these are correct, but they look pretty close. These language models aren't perfect. They often struggle with basic arithmetic and spatial relationships. They can also suffer from bias and stereotyping. So there's still a lot of important research left to do in this area. But if you need cooking ideas, large language models can help. Here I asked GPT-3 to create a new recipe, something that probably doesn't already exist on the internet. I like that it chose two different types of chocolate, cocoa powder and chocolate chips, which are incorporated in different ways into the recipe. And it knew that guacamole is made from avocados. And remember this neural network that we trained? Well, GPT-3 wrote the code. I just described the network I wanted and the function I wanted to fit in English. And GPT-3 generated the program automatically. The first few times I ran it through GPT-3, the code had one bug, but the third time produced Python code that ran perfectly. Mind-blowing. And of course, we can generate new songs in the style of Tangled Up in Blue. I recommend pausing this video to read these lyrics. They're pretty good. I hope you've enjoyed this video on large language models.